Okay, hi guys. Let's just start first because um, we don't have a lot of time today. So, right, welcome. So, this is just a quick introduction to Git in case you all haven't used it before. So, we'll be exclusively using the command line to introduce you all to the various features in Git. Okay, and later there'll be a short segment on how to use GitHub because it's the most popular uh, hosting service for Git repos. Okay. And it's also very useful for your SOC mods. Okay, so. Just checking, everyone has a GitHub account, right? No one does not have one. Okay, if you don't have one, you can just quickly create one now while I keep talking. Okay, and for all things Git, this is the authoritative manual. So it's pretty long and some of the commands are very uh, detailed. For example, if you just look at something simple, right? Like status, it has so many options and flags. Okay, yeah, but if you want to become a Git pro, this is the way to go. If you want to work with shell scripting and stuff, um, there's a lot of useful options here. That, so you can automate the whole Git workflow and stuff. So for that, you have to refer to this. There are some sample uh, usages as well, or, or you can go online and see how other people have set up their Git workflow in, in their uh, script files. Okay, so there's this other thing called, there's this other book, ProGit, um, but I mean, you don't really need it. Like the manual is enough. And okay, Googling is enough. Like Stack Overflow is enough as well. So, um, in general, why do we need version control? So it's just to track your changes over time. So basically, you what you need to do is whenever you're like, for example, you all are working on your like your Word document, right, for your essays and stuff. So you all have multiple drafts. So all these drafts that you create, it's very tedious to manually create one and go and go back and see the differences across drafts. So what it does is automate this for you. Okay, software engineers, right? We're all nerds, so we we like to uh make this as painless as possible for us. So that's how Git was born. To help us record and track our changes of time. So it's less painful for us. Okay, so it allows you to revert your drafts like, very easily or changes very easily. Okay, um, so you can also compare it over time. Right, so before Git, what did we have? We had BitKeeper. That was a proprietary VCS. Um, so, but then, yeah. Yes, there's Mercurial, there's SVN, there's BitKeeper, but BitKeeper was used for the Linux kernel. And th th this is the story of how Git started. So. Linux didn't like Cobalt didn't like BitKeeper, so he decided to write his own like <laughs> VCS. Um, yeah, because they reduced the free license, right? So, um, okay, quick question: Do you all know how long it took him to write the Git repo, like the first uh, in, you know, initial um, version? How long did it take uh, Cobalt to write uh, the first version of Git? Back all the way back in two thousand six. Yeah, it's it's a very uh so okay, it's in the order of weeks. It took him like two weeks, one to two weeks. I think about ten days, if I'm not wrong. So in ten days he had a working version of Git and that was about I think ten thousand lines of C code. Okay, so that was pretty fun um for him, I guess. Yeah, okay, that's just extra knowledge. You all don't need to <laughs> no. Yeah, um so what so yeah, in, in this case, um also uh that was VCS in general, but what Git is is it's distributed. So that's the difference. Like uh, most VCS, like SVN or Mercurial, are not distributed. There's a central repository, you know, like a client server model. So there's a central server that actually handles everything. But Git is distributed. So the history is preserved across every single machine that the repository is cloned to. Okay, so cloning is a term that maybe some of y'all don't know, but basically, um, there's a copy of all the history stored across all the different devices. There's no one single server that's uh, you know, storing the history or, you know, managing all the commits. Okay, so every commit is in general a snapshot of your files. So let me show you if the recording is properly. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, so um, every commit is a snapshot of your files. So what this means is the dropping or stopping on yourself. So every time you make changes, so make, for example, you make changes to B, A, and C, and A to like, so you change B in version 2, you change these two files in version 3. So this is how Git works. It's just basically like tracking the different changes. Okay, so that's the high level overview. Oh, how Git actually does this is actually quite um, interesting in practice. So what we have is um, three areas in Git. So you have the main repository. Uh, so you have the Git directory, which is the repository that you pull from. Like, you know, it's stored on your own server, or it's stored on GitHub, or GitLab, or wherever. So you take this repository and you clone it to your, you check it out to your local machine, or you initiate, you initialize a new repository on the local machine. Then you're in the working directory. 
Right, so this is where you start from. You start from working directory always. So what happens is any changes make your working directory can be staged. Okay, so what this means is when you stage, you are ready to, so this is like a kind of like a fine tuning area. So you have changes here, you stage them, then once you're satisfied with them, you commit them. And then you, once this is committed, you can push it to the remote and stuff. Okay, the remote is not shown, but, um, so this is committed to the local. So it's basically committed to, okay, let me just go through this again, because I'm using a lot of terms that maybe you all don't know. So remote is basically the uh, origin, like the server, like from where you pull, like it's the, um, so it's basically the other repo that you're tracking, that your local repo is tracking. Okay, so you're on a local machine, this white box is a local machine. You either clone it or you initialize a new repo, and then you check it out. So you're on the working directory, you make changes, if you're satisfied with them, if you make changes like say like file A, you satisfied with it, you stage it. But then you go back and you realize, hey, maybe file A, I need to change one or two more lines. You, go, you can go back, you can make more changes, and it's still still changes okay? Then once you've uh, made all these changes, you can sort of find, you can select which changes you want to commit. So staging area is like a sort of like a fine-tuning area. You can think of it that way. So working directory is everything where you make changes. Staging is for you to look at the changes and find for you to find you. And once it's satisfied, you can actually commit them. Okay, so you can commit them to the history. So I'm, by commenting and saying, look, this is good to go. I'm happy with my changes so far. Right, okay. This will, the differences here will come with practice, like how to use um, each area effectively. So this is not to worry about it if you don't get it now. But there's a reason for this complexity in Git. So it makes a life a lot easier when you want to manage your different changes. Okay, so in general, when you get started, you do need to um, set up for Git, you need to set up your username and your email, right? So let me just show you all. Oops. Is it very small? Okay, it is very small. Okay, you can. I think it looks good. If you all can't see, let me know. Okay, I'll just go to the slides first. Um, so basically, you need to set a username and your email, right? Then um, you can also set up your editor. So if, if you all prefer Nano, um, these are all text editors. So if you all don't know what this is, I think Nano or Vim is the most popular one. I don't know who's an Emacs fan here. <laughs> all right. So you can set up, okay, if you're using Windows, you would set up Notepad. Uh, otherwise, Nano or Emacs or Vim for uh, those of you all on Mac or Linux. Actually, I'm not sure about Mac. I don't know what Mac uses. Probably Nano or Vim. Uh, Right, so you can also use these, you can also just type git help or dash hatch. Okay, I'll show you all these uh, repos in a bit. Okay, so like for example, whoops. For example, if you wanted to type git help uh, diff, like for example, if I just typed git help diff for help on the diff command, so there's this command called uh, git diff. Um, so what this does is it helps you track changes across uh, your different commits or your different histories. But if you don't know what this command does, you can just basically type git help and you can type diff. So all this stuff here, you can actually find it on the manual, like the one I showed you all earlier, the SCM, this one, right? So all this information is actually here as well. So you don't need to use the terminal, but this is just convenient. Right. Okay, let's just create a new repository. And uh, git demo, let's just call it git demo. Okay, so I've created this repository called git demo. Don't know if it's too small. Okay, never mind. Uh, if it's too small, I'll zoom in time, from time to time. Right, so, right, so I'm in my repository called git demo. And let me just, all right, so these are commands. I want I'm initializing a brand new repository on my own, so I'll be just um just typing git in it. Okay, this is not ideal. Okay, so just be typing git in it, and that's all. Like right, you don't have to do anything more. So git will create everything. It will rename your if you type git branch, you can see the default branch is called master. 
right? So this is the uh, default one. And you can rename it as well by doing git branch dash m, right? So that's how you initialize a new repo. Right, so now let's uh, create a stage of file so we can create a file. I'll show you the process of staging a file, like, you know, the thing I was talking about just now. So let's just try this. So this I have, I'll be creating a file called hello. So I've created this, okay. Yeah, so uh, I've got a file called hello. Okay, maybe if you all don't know what these terms are. So I've got a file called hello and it just has hello. Yeah, that's all, okay. Um, right, so now if I type git status, it will say untrack file. There's a new file that's been added. So this hello is in my working directory. Okay. I can I can track it by doing git add hello. And now if I type git status, it's in my um uh staging area. Right? So this is how you stage a file. Like that's that's all. So yeah, git status is what you use to track uh, the different um files I've created. So if I say if I create one more file, git uh, like say echo new to new and if I type git status so you can see I have this in the staging area and this in my uh, working directory okay so there's a difference okay uh, later I'll show you how to remove a file from here or remove it from the staging area okay so keep that in the back of mind we'll just go on first okay and now if you want to look at what we staged there's this command. This is very useful. Like you'll be using this a lot. Okay, so this is the diff output. I'm not sure if y'all are familiar with diff output, but um, in general, what this is saying is it's very similar to the diff command. So if you just type diff command Linux, oh sorry, not Linux, and Linux like this, because because I'm using Linux, so um, I don't know if it's different for y'all. I don't know. Yeah, uh, it's the same, right? Okay, great. Um, so basically, you can go and read about the good, uh, the syntax. Okay, sorry, I'm searching the wrong thing. Okay, uh, in, okay, I guess it's the same. Whatever. You can go and read about this. I'll just quickly walk you through this. Um, so what this is saying is, there's a new part created. This b slash hello, and that this was okay. This is a Unix thing I grabbed now. So it's basically saying that there was no file before this. This new file was created, and it was one line was added to it. Right. So that's all. Okay, um, now I'm going on. So now this is in the staging area, right? We have staged the file successfully. Right, so we want to now commit it. So what we can do is, there's a very short and sweet command called, okay, I say sweet because it's not really sweet, it's just very annoying, actually. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's all. Okay, now if I type git status, you'll see that it disappeared from here. Okay, so now how do I know, how do I track my commits now? That's the next part. So I'll type git show. Right, so now I can look at, okay, wow, it's, I guess I zoomed in too much. Does it look fine actually to you? How does it look? Um, so this shows you, this shows you the commit. So this is called the commit hash. Basically git generates a hash. Uh, Based on the object uh, information, the general hash, a unique hash for all the comments in the repo. And this is the head pointer. I'll go to this data. The branch is called master, so head is called master. I'll go to this data. Okay? So I'm the author. And today, this will show you all the details about, of the commit. So what the changes you made, so this is the commit message, right? So just not what I typed was. When I typed this, git commit dash m, what I typed was, this at hello was the message. Right, so the message is shown here, and then the changes made are shown here. Okay, I'll go through the flow again. Sorry? Yes, yes. Uh, so you have to use the dash M. If you don't use it, it'll, uh, it'll auto generate uh, one for you, I think. Oh, yeah, I'll open an editor for you. 
So the dash M just tells you that this is the message I want to add. Okay, we can try without the dash M. Okay, so there's not, not much difference actually. So if you just... The body of the message. Yeah, so okay, for that, then you have to open the editor, like what Chunyu said. So let me just um, commit the... Okay, so there's... If you want to... Okay, just now we used... Um, let me go back through the flow again. I, I just quickly go. Okay, I'll answer your question when I go when I go through the flow again. So just to quickly walk through, through, I created a file here, I staged it, then I committed it. Okay, so I when I initialized my report, I also checked it out. Okay, so now after I staged it, I was okay, so I initialized it, then I created a file, then I staged it by using git add. Okay, so now let's just quickly uh Add new as well. Okay. Um. Then, uh, to show you all now, this is stage as well. Okay, we can skip this. We looked at the differences difference we've made. So now, what uh you were talking about will be here. So this is what will show up. Like um. So what you can do is this is the title, like title, and the body will come here. Like this is the commit message format for Git. So I'm using uh, nano here because I didn't change the default. So this is nano, like the text editor nano. Yes. The comments will be ignored. So these won't be these green lines won't be committed at all. Only this white text will be committed. So like test. I I, I guess I can we can just commit this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess it's fine. Okay, so yeah, that's how it looks like. Right? Um, okay, all okay so far, then? Uh, so this is all local so far. Like, I haven't pushed these to my rep remote repository yet. So this is all only on my computer. Like y'all can't see it. No one else can see it. Cause I haven't pushed it yet. Okay. Um, so yeah, this, this was the line I added. So that's all like for line zero in the first file, I added this new line and that's all. That's all that this message is saying. Okay. Um, and this is the index tracker, which is not really useful now. Okay. Going on. Uh, you can type git show, or uh, there's one more called git log, which I will go through later. <laughs> um, okay, so git show will show you the most recent one. And git log will show you the whole list. So git show again. Okay, maybe this is, I'll zoom up a bit. Yeah, git show and git log. Okay, so that's the two. Uh, right, okay, let's change a file here. So now I've committed this file. Okay, I'm using Vim, uh, doesn't matter. So now you can see I have two files. I've committed both of them. Okay, maybe this is the UI is more familiar for you all. I have two files, hello and new. I've committed both of them. So now I want to edit. Say uh, I've come back to my project like a couple of days later. I want to edit my hello file. So I'm editing my hello file. I'm adding stuff to it. Hello, I'm making some new changes. Changes. Oh wow, feeling happy. I don't know. Okay, I'll. Uh, I made those changes to my file. Now I'll show you all how it looks. So this is my updated file. Right now, I'll type the git diff command, and you can see how it looks like now. Right, so basically, what I've done is added this line and added a new line. So this is actually a new line. Okay, my previous file didn't have a new line, so that's why there's this first sign of it. So it's just basically telling me I've added a new line to my a blank line to my file. Okay, in mixers, most mostly your files should edit a new line. Any 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 text file should edit a new line. Historical reasons for that. Okay, not really relevant, but yeah, this is the main one. Okay, the one in green. So the plus sign tells you that I've added it. 
Okay, so look at this then. What if I delete it? So I deleted the first line. Now, uh, now that it's deleted, it shows up in red. Okay, wait, let me just clear the old one. Yeah, it shows up in red. Right, so this is how you track the changes of it. Okay, so in the first file, from lines 1 to 2, I've changed these two lines. Okay, that's the git diff command. No, this is just uh, in my working directory. I'm not even staged yet. Uh, when do you make the same changes as I did, or it depends on the changes you made. <laughs> okay, we'll wait for Chunyu to come away. You can wait for Chunyu to come over, I guess. I'll just carry on. Or maybe we'll take a break, a five minute break at 7 15, I guess, uh, to work on this. I'll show, I'll show the slides again. Oh, yeah, so this is the commit history. So you type git lock, and you will see these two commits I've made so far. Right? Okay, I'll just commit my third one. Third commit. Oh, oops, sorry, I've not added it. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not even on stage my files yet. Yeah, I've not even staged. So right now what happened is, I didn't even stage my one file, so I'm going to stage it first. So um, there's a shortcut. If you want to stage everything, you can use git add dash a, or you can, okay, it's like, if you you can use git dash a, or you can just uh, type the name on the file. So I just type the name of the file since it's easier to follow. Um, then git uh, status. So I'll just check it's changed. Uh, it's been staged. Git diff, no differences. Right. Um, so now I can commit it. Um, the commit. Okay, but y'all can see the benefit, right? So over here, I am not staged it yet. So it's still my working directory. So imagine if all our files are changing at the same time. There's some files I'm sure of that other key. I can just stage them first. Then I go, and go back and work on the other files yet. This is what I mean by fine tuning. You can, you know that these files are roughly good to go, but you still don't want to commit them yet. You want to like, review them for later. And these are the files you're still working on. So you're working there too is where you're making all the changes. Your staging area is where you're sure that this is somewhat like the final, uh, File you want it to be, and commit is once you're done with everything. You're adding the file, so you mean this is it? So, what was the name of the file? Okay, uh, yes, yes. So, the, so I'll show you what happens if I edit a file. Uh, I've come back to this project a couple of days after, after I've made the initial commit, right? So, let me just commit this. So, let me just show you get locked. Okay, so this was. Say so done on day one, done on day two, done on day three. But I've only changed hello in this file, I've modified it. I've added hello in there. So you all saw um like touch txt. Okay, so basically I created a temp file and I have an untracked file. So for new files, it will always say untracked. So say I add it. Get add temp.txt. So now it will say new file. Right? Then if I modify it, if I modify my hello file, I'll show you all the differences. Um, modified. Okay, get status. Okay, so you can see that this is state and this is. I've staged my new file, I've a modified unstaged file. Okay, that's confusing, but there's a difference. So this is just modified, and this is a new file. This is unstaged, this is staged. Okay, so maybe if I rename the hello to hello.txt. Hello. Because I think the extensions are what some of y'all are used to. Okay, so. Now, good things because I made that I renamed it. Good things I deleted the old one and made a new one. 
Yeah, that's not really relevant. Yeah, I have to add, I have to add, so I can add hello.txt. Okay, this is slightly advanced, but okay, now, now I've only, I've added hello.txt. You all think that my hello, this change has been staged or not? You all think this has been staged? Okay, so I've definitely done this, right? I've definitely staged my hello.txt, but has this happened? Does he know about this? The answer is no, I'll show you all. Okay, so Kit doesn't know that he deleted the file. So this is still unstaged. Okay, this is slightly advanced. Y'all don't really need to know this yet. Like, I mean, this is just because of practice, I guess, experience. But get uh, stage on you. So these are two separate changes. So to stage or comment them both. All right, so I have to get at hello. Then I've tried get status. Yep. Now, now you can see. Let me just clear the command. So now you can see the difference. Okay, so that's, that's how Git knows it now, right? So they are because okay, the this is like it seems a peculiar, but this is also because of the way our, our OS works and stuff. Right? This was the best that uh, can be done, I guess. Right, okay, moving on. Okay, any questions so far? That is the basics of adding, modifying, staging, committing, and doing your history. And that is, a, that, actually that is all you need to know to work with Git, like to be honest. Okay, there's still push and pull, which I'll come to later, but the basics is that. Okay, so to get started, that's enough. Okay, now this is slight, somewhat of a niche use case. So say, um. You want to ignore some files, like say I have, uh, you know, like environment files, like your dot files or environment files or your compiled, your, your intermediary binary, your, com your object files or your binaries. You want to ignore those sometimes. Sorry? Yeah, the build folder, stuff like that. Um, yeah. Uh, so if you want to ignore that, you need your git ignore file. So basically this is telling git that I don't want you to look at changes I make to these files or to these folders. Okay, so if I show y'all, okay, so right now I don't have it. Okay, so basically let me just demo this to y'all, git ignore me. So this is a file I want to ignore. Basically, I've just created, okay, maybe I'll rename it .txt. Yeah, so this is a file I've created. And it shows up as, git will, git will start tracking it. It'll start like, it will start tracking it, sorry, wrong term. It will start looking at it, okay? Uh, so, but you don't want this file to be looked at by Git. So what can you do about this? You can create something called a git dot git ignore file. Okay, so let me just ignore me, type the command. Okay, so it will still show up. The reason for this is because you haven't um, added it yet. Figure it out. So we'll need to do this first. I'll just show you all this first. Then we'll type git status. And then we'll. Oh, oops, did not. Okay, so going through the flow again, basically you need to create a file, a git ignore file. So the dot basically tells you it's a hidden file, but right? as I say for Windows, a dot in front of the file name says it's hidden. So it won't show up, like for me, it won't show up here. I have all these four files, but it won't show up. But if I ask my OS to show the hidden files, these are the hidden files. So I get hidden git folder, but I get ignore files, which is hidden. So then I will add it, stage it, then I'll commit it. Then I will type status ignore to see how it works. So basically, you can start ignoring this file for me now. Okay. Oh, whoops. 
Okay, and that is uh, not the way it should go. I kind of forgot how to do this. Okay, never mind. I'll come back and uh, maybe I'll show you all this again. Uh, okay, I'll show you all this again in, uh, later. I need to go and check this. Okay, but typically what we ignore is stuff like generated files, like intermediary build files or build artifacts. Um, like stuff like non dependencies for your JavaScript for, for your JavaScript projects or for your C and C++, PYC for Python. Your, these folders like slash, slash bin is a binary, out is the output. So all these folders are typically get ignored. Like your log files as well and your ID files, like for example, my IntelliJ files or my VS Code files in dot, in dot VS Code, all these will be ignored. Okay, so if you're curious, ignore. So um, some kind souls have created uh, sample getting off files. So, for example, for JavaScript, or maybe for Java, since that's, um, and maybe I'll show you for C++, because that's the bigger one. All right, so this is what a sample getting off file looks like. So, all of these are the uh, object files. This is the header files, or the compiled headers. Uh, the LLs for Windows, SO for Linux, and Mac. So all these files, you wouldn't want, normally want to commit it, right? So this is one getting off file. This is the other one for our uh, Java, like your Java files and your log files, I guess. Okay, so this is stuff you ignore. And uh, just, uh, just a fair warning, this getting off file uses uh, globs, like it uses like FN match. So what this means is you can't use regex. So you have to use something called um, like it's not, it's, you can't use regex. You can't use regular expressions like your Perl based syntax. You have to use something called uh, the glob syntax, which is slightly different. It's similar to what regex is, but slightly different as well. Okay, so yeah, that's a bit advanced. Maybe that's not really relevant now. Oh wait, it's here. Um, okay. So yeah, so these double asterisks basically say recursively go inside these directories, go inside the the subdirectories in this directory as well. Okay, so this is basically telling you all these files in this directory. And this is saying recursively enter subdirectories as well. So this is from the base folder. So from any folder at the, at the, at the base, this is for any, for even for log files within subdirectories inside a repo. Okay, so these are all different configurations. You don't need to know all of them. But the whole idea is that you can choose if you want to ignore subdirectories or directories only, or if you want to ignore um, certain directories that can only be accessed through the base. Like, yeah, so all these different configurations are possible. So to do that, you have to go to this uh, pattern format page and see um, how Git does it. Okay, they have all examples. So you can just look at the examples. And your ex these basic examples should basically serve most of your needs in most cases. Okay. Um, Maybe you take a five minute break now. Y'all can go and try the previous commands and play around for a bit. Then you just walk around and you'll see if y'all need any help, I guess. Oops. Oh. <laughs> 
How do you get it stuck? Oh, it's, this is the link. Oh, okay, okay. thanks. Okay, I'm trying to understand.
Okay, yeah, so because just now my get ignore did not have this <laughs> and I didn't realize. So I was wondering why it's still working. Thank you. 
Um, right, so I'll just show it to you all again, I guess. So. So I'll just show you all um, the get ignore process again. It was just now I made a very silly mistake. So what happened was get ignore. So this is my current get ignore file, right? Uh, it has these two files that I'm ignoring. Okay, so say there's one file I want to ignore. Say I will call it um, ignore me. I, I guess second demo. Okay, and then if okay, so I've added the file. Um, now I need to commit my getting off first, so I'll do that first. Then get commit dash m update getting off. Okay, and then now say if I create. If I create a new file called dot um, ignore me again, okay. So I've created this file called ignore me again. So okay, whoops, photo dot txt. Right. So okay, it won't show up here, right? But if I type dash ignore. It will show up as an ignore file. So these three files, these three files are all ignored. Okay, so y'all can see. Okay, so that's the whole um, procedure. That's not what happened once I forgot the dot txt. That was what I said. Okay, but <laughs> that's fine, I guess. Um, okay, now let's move on. Um. Oh yeah, um, this is, I don't know if how many of y'all use a Mac, kind of large number. Um, so there's always this Mac OS X file that Mac likes to create, <laughs> like it's kind of funny. Um, and there's a slash db store file as well that um, is inside this as well. So typically you want to get ignore all those as well because it's for the, uh, I think it's for the find utility in Mac or something. Or uh, basically your, your file manager in Mac. Okay, so other OSs don't need that. So you want to ignore that as well, because it's auto generated anyways, right? Um, okay, now moving on to the second segment. So now, right now you are working on this as one person, right? So now what is what happens is there are multiple people working on this. Okay, so you have multiple repositories on. Okay, you have multiple copies of repositories checked out on different developers' machines. Okay, and all of them are working on this simultaneously, right? So this is the scenario here. Okay, so in Git, right, branching is actually considered cheap. 
in the sense that you want to branch often and branch frequently. So that's a maximum you always here in Git. Okay, so whenever you want to make changes, always branch first in that sense. Okay, so a branch is simply, and it's called a pointer, right? Like, it just points to a commit. Okay, so master branch will point to this commit. Okay, like just now when I showed you all, okay, now, so all of these are the hashes, right? So th this line eight C A nine is just the short form of this very long hash. Okay, so this every commit is uniquely identified by its hash. Okay, um so all these hashes represent the commits. Then the master points to this, the master branch points to F30 AB. Then you have another branch called testing, it points to this as well. Okay, so both these branches point to the same base of it. But level point A might be working on this branch, but level B, level B might be working on this branch. Here, yeah, like, they might be doing different stuff on the on different branches, but the base commit is the same. So, um, head basically just tells you that is the branch you're working on. Okay, so, right now, in this case, you're on the master branch. Uh, you're okay, you're basically on this commit. Okay. It's not actually the branch, but it's actually it's pointed to the commit. Okay, so, you're currently at this one. Okay, so why use branching? So, basically, for simultaneous, that's the whole point of distributor. That's the whole point of uh, get being distributed. Uh, so, you can work on it simultaneously and you don't. You can make different changes to the code simultaneously. Okay, so you can create multiple, you can have multiple features in parallel. So every time you commit, you can have divergent. Okay, maybe I'll show you all the picture. It's just kind of difficult. Oh, uh, sorry, what do you say? Uh, yeah, so pull request is a GitHub specific feature. It's not actually for Git. So I'll come to pull request later. So you won't see pull requests in Git. It's not Git specific. Yeah. So you won't see that in Git. So basically, um, okay, but this whole thing is just to show you all, this is the master branch, the commit that the master branch is pointing to. Developer, developer A is pointing here, developer B is pointing here. So you see they can go on, they can keep adding their own commits in like one long sequence, okay? And the master branch, other people may just want to see this one. Okay, so that's the whole idea. Okay, um, maybe that picture was not very great. Let me just see if I can show you all a better picture. Okay, yeah, this is a lot better. Um, okay, I should just show you all this. Um, right, so master branch, so you can keep on adding the master branch and some of the developers might continue working on this commit. Okay, so this, this commit only knows that its previous commit was here, so it doesn't know all these changes. That's what they mean by in parallel. You can make all these changes in parallel. So this commit doesn't know all this commit, but they're still having some TSC on different branches. Okay, so that's the whole idea. Okay, uh, maybe this will be clearer over time. So, right, so the whole idea is to make sure that if A breaks, it doesn't affect B or to keep your changes separate. So you only commit to the master branch when you're ready. So your master is typically your production. It represents like your production ready code and your feature branches are all representing the different stages at which your feature is being implemented at. Okay, so that's the whole idea. So you keep developing, you, you can maintain one a branch uh, to represent the current deployment or the current production. Okay, so how do you create a new branch? Right now we are on. Okay, let me just type this out. So we are on the master branch, but now say we want to create a new branch. Okay, so you check out the project. Like also, when you check out the project, you, you, you can check out the master main branch. In this case, you're checking out the uh, new feature branch. Okay, so we have switched to it. Right. Um, so, okay, let me just have a good show so you all can see. 
Where is it? Yeah, so this commit is on the master branch, but the head is pointing to the new feature branch. Okay. Right. Sorry? The book as in? Oh, it's, it's different? Oh, okay. Oh, okay, when you create a new branch, is it? Oh, yes, so um, that's, that's the convenience of checkout. So checkout is you create a new branch and then you switch. Yeah. Yeah, so it's two steps in one, which is very nifty. Like when you create a new branch, you think you want to check out, check it out as well, which is why you just use git checkout. Like, so you don't have to do those two separate commands. So that's why it's convenient. Um, but yeah, so this typically, like, if you didn't do that, if you didn't use a B flag, you would do these two steps. So if I just show it to you all, git branch, uh, third branch, I guess. Then uh, if I type this status, I'm still on new feature, right? Because I didn't um, use, I didn't check it out yet. So in this case, I have to explicitly tell Git to check out um, a third feature, uh, sorry, third branch. Okay. So the, the which one? No, my status. I have to type Git status. Oh yes, this is Bash. I mean, uh, you can set up your your other shell such that it shows you like the branch you're on. Like you have to change the PS one variable, but that's like perfectly good setup. Like not really for. I didn't really do it. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's. I guess Bash doesn't do it. So. Um. Right, so maybe I'll just type this to show you all how you all can keep track. So this tells me I'm on, I'm on currently on my third branch. Okay, so you can only be on one branch at any one point of time. Okay, so it's kind of intuitive or kind of obvious, but like you just gotta see it. So get checkouts. Going back to master. So this is how you switch branches. So this is pretty simple, like nothing. Uh, difficult about this is just tedious because you have to keep typing git checkout and name of the branch. Okay, so for me, I've auto complete, so I'm not sure if this is a Windows. I think it should be there on Windows as well. It's, it's a git thing. So I can just type third, I can auto complete the rest. Okay, so that's useful. Okay, so now let's go back to um, your feature. Say I want to. Uh, Add a couple more stuff to this. So say I'm developing a new feature. So I'll say um, maybe I'll just uh, file.txt. So hi, this is a new feature, I guess. Oh, oops, I closed it. Right, so I've created this new file.txt and I'm on my new feature branch. Right, so that's, um, let's commit this. New file.txt, get commit. Okay, so I've committed this as well. If I type git show, it should say that I've added this file. Uh, I've added a new file for a new feature. I've created this new file and this is the change I've made. Okay, so so far this is all this is all something we've covered before. Um, now, what happened is let me show you all the git log. So what happened is my um, my new feature has this commit, but third branch or the master branch doesn't have it, right? So I'm currently my head is also pointing the new feature, new feature by the way. So the new feature branch has the status commit. But all my, my master branch is here, so there's a difference. So I've got a new commit, and the master branch doesn't know about. So how do I tell the master branch to update itself and bring it forward? Okay, so say I think this feature is ready. I want to update my master branch and merge it back to my master. So the the way to do that is called um 
So I have to check out my master branch first. Okay, so these are all like, this is a, this is a recipe, okay? So you just gotta memorize this. Okay, so you gotta check out master branch first. Then git merge, a uh, new feature. And that's all. I type git log. So I can see that my master branch now has uh, that commit as well, okay? So git, I'm gonna just delete the third branch, which is kind of useless. Okay, uh, okay, now, okay, yeah, so this commit is there on both parts now. So this is something called fast forwarding. So fast forwarding basically is a, a specific type of merging, which doesn't update, which doesn't create a merge commit. Okay, so I'll show like an example. This is best understood by understanding what merge commits are. So in fast forwarding, you don't have merge commits, but in other types of merging, you'll have, in the other type of merging, you'll have merge commits. Okay, so just uh, keep this in mind. This is something of fast forwarding where you don't have merge commits. I'll show you an example of what a merge commit looks like. Okay, so this is the end state now. Okay, so um, we can even delete it. So right now, what if we have uh, two branches pointing to the same thing, which is kind of redundant. If, um, if, I've already done, if I've already developed this, I don't need this anymore, right? I, my master branch is good enough for me to keep track of why. Uh, current production ready code, so I don't need my new feature. So I'll just delete it. So the command is branch the D flag for deletion. A uh, new feature, right? So that's all. Right. Um. Now I'll show you what happens when you have merge conflicts. So just now, what happened was I edited a file. Oops. Okay. No. I edited, okay, sorry, whoops, git show. I just added a new file, right? I didn't modify an existing file. So what happens is that in the parallel case where I talked about here, like these guys, they all edit the same files. So what happens when you edit the same file? Like, the same file is being edited, say this commit, this commit, this commit. And then once you start merging it all back to the master branch, you don't have merge for this. Right? So that's what we're talking about here. So ideally, this is not a Good scenario, right? So you want to, when you merge it, you want to fix those merge conflicts. So just to reiterate, because this is slightly confusing. Say I have a file called, uh, like my main.c or something. I've got a file called main.c. And I created it here. When I modify it here, I, mo I this developer modifies it in this commit and this commit as well. When later on, I start merging all them back together to the master branch. I'll need a way to resolve uh, all these different conflicts. So usually what happens is that if you're lucky, all those changes affect different lines. But if they all, like if some of those changes happen on the same line, say you delete one line and another user, uh, I don't know, changes the variable on that line. So you have two divergent changes. One guy is deleting it, the other guy is changing the variable on the line. So you want a way to resolve that. And the way to resolve that is the whole, is what we're gonna go, is what we're gonna go through now. Okay, so, let me send y'all. Okay, y'all have access to the slides, right? So, if y'all could go to this link, uh, under hacker school git slash merge conflict, and if we just clone this. Okay, so for GitHub, the way to clone it is, you click here, and then you just, I can use, you can just use HTTPS. So you can just click here. Uh, I'm, I basically copied the URL, like this thing. Then I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna type git clone. I'm going to paste the URL. Okay, so that's all. Okay, so just to show you all again, this is the web page. I click on code, I click on HTTPS or SSH. You've already set that up, but I don't think most of you would have. Uh, then you can click on this, copied, then git clone. Okay, so yeah, that's all. I don't, I don't do it in the git demo folder, like do it in a separate folder outside of git demo. Like you shouldn't mix your different git repos together. Although you can, then that's a topic of sub modules, but not really relevant now. Okay, does it feel like one way to do this? Yes.
Okay, let's go on. I think most of us should have done it. Okay. Okay, now I'm going to go to the folder, CD into it. Then, uh, yeah. Okay, if you're using Windows or PowerShell, I realize it might be different. So for Windows, I'm not sure. Yeah, okay, it's the same command, I guess. Um, so it should be fine. So you can just see it into it, and then we have um, a file called by. So let me go and show it to you all. Right, so this is the current status, the current state of the folder. Okay, so now if you look at this, we have three branches here. We have conflict one and conflict two. So this is what is called the remote. So this is my local copy, my local git repo is tracking my remote git repo. Right? So and on the remote, we have conflict one. We have master branch, we have conflict one and conflict two. Okay, so these three branches. Okay, so now let's check those out. Okay, so basically what this says is my local branch conflict one is tracking my remote branch conflict one from the origin. Local copy of this branch have uh, a branch on the remote as well. That's basically what the message is saying. So I have a local copy of my contact one branch now. I'll just type git branch. Maybe I'll show it to you all. Yeah. So you see, I don't have contact two yet, right? That's because I didn't check it out. But I can, like, if I wanted to. So now I have contact two as well. Oops. Right. So that's the difference between local branches and remote branches. Yeah. In these cases, all my local branches are tracking my remote branches. Um. Okay, now let's go back to conflict one. Okay, now the step is to check out master. Okay, so now we're back on master. Let's just make sure what I missed that is. All right, cool. Okay, now you can see this also. Your branch is up to date with the origin slash master. So because my local branch is tracking my remote, previously we didn't see this like for, for the for um, this one, we didn't see that, right? Oh, it's a bit small. Hang on. Okay, but <laughs> never mind. Okay, so you can see we didn't see that for the other repo because the other this repo git demo is not tracking any remote branch. This branch on the grid demo is not tracking any remote branch. Okay, but this merge conflict one is. So that's the difference. Okay, just in case you're all wondering. Okay. Now this is the current status of the merge conflicts. Okay, so the two branches, conflict one and conflict two have separate commits. Okay, so there's this very nifty command called git log graph all. Okay, so the whole idea is to get this, get this in the terminal. Okay, that's the whole idea. So that, that command basically just okay. That's interesting. Why is it shaking? Okay, I don't know. Um, yeah, but basically the whole point is to get this graphic image into a, a terminal. So that's what the git log graph all does, command does. Yeah, otherwise git log is very basic. It doesn't give us much info. Wow, it's kind of messy. It doesn't give us much info like this, okay? It's not very useful. So let's go on to the next one. So right now we are on on the master branch. So say we merge conflict one into our master branch. Okay, so we have 
this commit make buy more formal on the master branch as well. So previously it was only on config one. So now we will we see this is saying what this is saying is in case you're wondering, my local master branch, the origin config one, and my local config one have this commit. Okay? Uh, and this commit, my origin master and my origin head only have this commit. Okay, so that's what this is saying. Now let's try. Remember the, the whole idea is to merge these two commits back to master. So I'm only merge kind of contact one, but now I'm merge contact two as well. So let's try that and see what happens. Okay. Okay, so what this this is actually quite scary. I mean, if you're working with Git and you see this message, you're always gonna hate it because then you have to go back and understand what changes other people have made to the branches. So if you're working on Git and you see this, you're always like, gonna hate this message. Okay, so um, the idea is now that we understand the differences that were made and need to fix it. Okay, so if you type git status, and you'll say this, fix conflicts and run git commit. It's basically telling us you have conflicts and, you need to, and then you need to commit, you need to create a merge commit to resolve, after you resolve all these conflicts. Okay. Otherwise, if you don't want to merge these conflicts, you can just abort the merge. Because you didn't know, you didn't know before the merge that conflicts were going to happen. So now that you realize the conflicts and you realize that people have made changes to the code that, the code that you worked on, you want to go back and review the changes more, once more again and, you know, make some more changes. You can just abort the merge first and then you can go back and make those changes first. And then you can merge at a, at a later time. Okay. But otherwise, you can just uh, run, you can fix the conflicts and you can fix the conflicts and then you can run git commit. Right. So, now let's see. Okay. So this is, this looks like pretty okay, doesn't it? Um, we see what has happened is on the config branch, someone added farewell and on the head branch, someone added goodbye. Okay. So if I was to show y'all, Maybe this will be clearer if I was to show you all the original code. So on the master branch, the by file just says by. Okay. On the conflict one branch, the by file says goodbye. And on the conflict two branch, the by file says farewell. Okay, so you see what happened? The, on the master branch, it says bye. On conflict one, it says goodbye. And on conflict two, it says farewell. So two people made the same change. Two people change the same line in two separate commits. So when you merge these changes back, you need to figure out a way to pick those changes. Like which one do you want to keep? Okay, so in our case, it doesn't matter to us. It doesn't matter to us, like, because this is not really like proper code. So I can just, um, yeah, so, okay, so the way to fix merge conflicts is, you first you understand the syntax. Okay, so this equal sign says, this is the, this, okay, so basically on top is what is in the head and below is what is in the other branch. So this is um, just a way to delimit, so it's like delimiter. So these, these are relevant signs, equal signs, and uh, more than signs are delimiters. Okay, so goodbye is on, is on the head branch because it came from conflict one and we already merged it. And farewell is on the conflict two branch. So these are the two conflicting changes on the same line. Okay, so to resolve this, what I need to do is delete all that stuff, resolve the conflicts. Say I want to keep the changes from uh, conflict one. I don't want the conflict two changes. I just uh, Edit the file and then leave it like this. Okay, so that's all. So previously the file looked like this, but now I resolve the merge conflict and it looks like this now. Okay, so that's all. So we have resolved it basically. And if you type git status again, the next thing to do, we have done this step. Okay, so the next thing to do is to 
git commit. Commit. Yep. So you see, Git has already auto filled in the commit message for you in this case. Because previously, the whole idea was that you're trying to merge the branch, right? So you had issues merging your merge conflicts. So the commit message says, this is, uh, this is me trying to merge config2 into master. These are the changes because I was merging config2 into master. So that's what the commit message is saying. So that's why Git has also filled it into you, filled it in very neatly for you. I mean, you can always edit it. You don't have to keep it. So I can um, edit it as well. Okay, so that's all. And if I type git log now, you see, so that's all. Okay, so conflict one has only this conf commit, conflict two has only this commit, and my master branch has both commits now. Okay, so if I was to type git log graph all, okay, wow, well, this is rather tiny. I need, uh, this is rather large. Let me just zoom out a bit. Okay, so y'all can see. Um, Okay, maybe y'all can't really see the corners. Y'all can see now. Yeah, this is all better. So my origin master is over here. My conflict one is at this one. Conflict two is at this one. Origin conflict one is here. And my local one as well is here. Origin conflict two and my local conflict two is here. And my local master is here. Okay? So this is basically saying these are the two divergent branches, and I've merged both these commit here already. Okay, so that is the way to visualize it, right? Yeah, so basically this has happened. Uh, but yeah, this has happened. Okay, so my local for is zero, my local for is zero. But uh, my local master is not here, so my remote master is here. Okay, so that is the current status of changes after I resolve all these conflicts. Okay, so this does not always need to happen if you're lucky. These two separate commits won't like, modify the same line or the same file. So if you're lucky, you can merge these two separately without having all these merge conflicts. But it's not always the case, especially if you are if you have a very large commit. Right? So that depends on uh, the commit in nature. Right, so a oh, quick primer to GitHub. So Git itself is a version control system. But GitHub is a service that allows you to host repositories on Git. Okay, so when you always need, uh, you do need some remote server for Git, right? When you have this distributed workflow, you always need to say, my local copy is going to track uh, the other copy. Okay, so right now, for example, for the Git demo, you don't always need to do this, right? If for Git demo, we didn't have any um, like remote repository. We were just so what what this what the benefit of this is we can still track our draft versions, right? Like so if you were to cd into right, so we can still we can still like use Git for look for like repository on a machine, uh, even though it doesn't track any remote branch, right? Because you can still Check all the different changes of me. So still you so other people. Then you need to host it somewhere. You need to have a repository that someone is hosting so that your branches can track that repository. Yeah, otherwise you wouldn't know how to sync up, right? You need a way, you need a common point for you to sync up. Okay, so that's the whole idea of what GitHub is doing. So GitHub is providing that link in between for you to sync up. Okay. Um Okay, let's just go through this step by step in case y'all. Okay, the interface changes if I full screen. So, let me just, so the steps are we'll be creating a new repo on GitHub first, okay? And then we'll push to it. Okay, so if I was to just go and click on new, 
So get demo. Oh wait, screw. Uh, right, so this is a repository I'm creating. The description is optional and it's public. Uh, all these settings, you can add a readme file. So what this does is, uh, okay, like for example, for, let me just see how the, okay, we can just look at the git, git slash. Okay, we can just look at the kids. Uh, wow, okay, that's a bit of scolding. Okay, um, so this thing, readme file, will appear on your GitHub repo like this. Okay, so GitHub will display it for you. But otherwise, it's very common practice to have a readme file in a repository so that you can show people how to set up a repository, how to get started with the build process, the, you know, common features, common commands, stuff like that. So it's very common to have a readme file to serve as an uh, introduction. All right, so this is... GitHub's a git readme file. This is we can just add one, and uh, well, GitHub also conveniently has some for you. So just use Shabas. I mean, this is not really relevant, but you can set it if you want to. I mean, you can choose one, any random one, up to you. All right. So we have these two files. If we didn't choose those options before, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have these two files. Okay. So. Okay, um, right. Let's. Okay, let's create a new repo and uh, in it, in it, and then we. Okay, this might not work because I have created new files, but let's just try. Then we will. So I've got this unchecked file now. I want to stage it. Um, and then commit it. And okay. Then I've committed it. I just like get status. Okay, right, so I've got that commit in. Now what I need to do is add this as a remote. Add my, uh, okay, add this repository as my remote. So I'll need to just get the URL, this one, for HTTPS, and get remote add. Okay, then I'll just get push. I don't think I need the dash U flag, but right. Right, so now I've got, because I pushed to the master branch, but maybe I should push to main. Oops. Okay. Right, so I need to get more. Oh, oops, yep, yeah, I need to set my upstream. Let me demo this to y'all again. Uh, Oh yeah, so on my, okay, so basically what happened was on my, okay, because I created, okay, let me just create one more. No, because my local computer, my local machine created one master. No, I, that's because I didn't create an empty repo as well anyways. So let's create one new repo. Let me just, because that was confusing, I guess. 
Yes, the problem is I selected those options before, right? So that created a, a main branch. Okay, so if you didn't select those options, this is what you have. Okay, so let me just... Oops, I knew that was going to happen. Uh, Okay. okay, now let's do this again. We will just uh new repo. Okay, then I'll just type it in here. Okay, so what happened is that this branch has no this this remote repo has no branch at all. Okay, so it doesn't matter what I call your the branch name here. Okay, so now I will just create uh, my first commit, and then I will just add this. Okay, so I'm just adding my hello.txt. Then if I type get status, I can see that I have not added a remote yet. Okay, so because of this, yeah, I need to I know I need to add a remote. So if I try git push, you can see there'll be an error code. Okay, no configure push destination. So I just need to add my remote. And how I do this is so git remote add origin is the name of uh, my remote. Now in this case I can call it something else. I can call it like uh remote as well. I can call it like origin is what is what is what we usually use. Okay, so it's just best to stick to convention, I guess. Then I'll just paste this in. Okay, then if I type git push again, it should work. Okay, it shouldn't work actually because I've not set up my upstream branch. Okay, so that's why there's a dash u flag. The dash u flag here will set the upstream. Okay, so in case you ever forget to set upstream, you can just copy paste this command and that's fine. Or you can do the short form if you do if you do remember. You can just use the short form. Yep, so um, that is all that we need to do. And if we go here, if you refresh the page, now we see that's all. That, that, that has been updated on my GitHub repo as well. Okay, so, okay, now what if you did choose all these options and you created hacker school, like for example, for this one, you chose all the options and you did create a couple of files here. What you can do is you can just copy this and then you can just, oops, maybe I shouldn't use this. You can just clone it straight away. And hack a school demo, and I'll have the readme file, and yeah, oh, you can see I have the getting ignore and the readme file both, right? So the readme file is empty. Yeah, so that's what you can do if you uh, select all these options here. Okay. Uh, otherwise, you can set up get in. You can do get in it on your local. You can follow these steps. You can get in it on your local first. Okay. So that's what you have to do if this repository was empty. Okay, now moving on. Okay, so um, just now what we did was when we cloned these, originally when we cloned this repository, the merge config, we also um, we downloaded just the master branch. And then what happened was we checked out the config branch. And then you check out the config branch. But say after you check these branches out, what happened? What happens if somebody else uh, goes and pushes that and just copy one? That means your local copy. So say this is your local branch, this is a local state. But on the remote, someone adds more branch, more commits to config two. So how do you update your local copy with the remote? For that, you need git pull or git fetch and merge. So git pull is a convenience command for uh, something called git fetch and merge. So git fetch, what git fetch does is it updates your 
your local little changes, but it doesn't, it updates your index of the changes, but it doesn't implement those changes in case you feel that uh, you don't need those changes or if, in case you want to um, uh, take some time and understand those changes first. Okay, so typically, okay, hang on. So typically, I'll just do git pull, but what I can do is git fetch as well. Then I can merge. After I fetch, I can still merge my changes, right? So that's the alternative. Okay. Um, so just now what I was talking about was mergers. So there are two ways of updating uh, your git branches. You have a merge, you can either merge your changes or you can rebase the changes. So there's these two uh, different approaches. So this is um, so no, it's not that time we had this merge commit. So this is what happens when you use the merge method. So you get uh a merge commit. So this is called a merge commit. So it's an extraneous commit that doesn't really, it just serves as a marker of the fact that they've merged the two branches together. Okay, so but otherwise, say you had these, you have these two branches and you want to uh, merge this, this commit to this area. But you want this extra merge commit, say you think it's unnecessary, okay, the reason for choosing the base is to so like keep your common history clean. Because you can see that if you do uh if you do these merge commits, right, you have this actual commit that sometimes some people don't really like it more. It depends on the git workflow. So some some depending on the workflow, you may or may not want these merge commits. Alright, so if you have these here, some people don't want these here, so if you prefer a rebase method where you have only the three commits that you know have actual code. This just serves as a mark of the merge. It doesn't actually serve any there's actually no real change being made in this version. Speak to reiterate, all the, the different developers have made changes in these three commits. Now I want to merge this commit uh, into this, these two, right? Into this branch. I can do either merge or I can do a rebase. But if I do a merge, I have this extra commit that, that pops up. But if I don't want that, I can just rebase. So rebase will just create a new commit and add it to the end. Right? So it just doesn't, it doesn't have the merge of it. Right? So that's the main benefit of rebase. Yes, but squash is, we won't cover that today. Like if you understand merge and rebase, that's good enough. Like squash is even more. Like, but okay, you can, the reason why you can do that is because maybe you're working on your repositories yourself, but if there are other people, and if you do that, what happens if you just basically change the, the Git history for all those different people as well? So basically on their machine, it will say that their history is divergent from yours or from the remotes, which is a very difficult scenario to patch up if you do that. So that's why you wouldn't want to uh, do what you just said, yeah. So there's a reason for why uh, so the, the problem being rebasing is, like just now I said, right? Merge commit, it creates a new commit, and that's fine. You still have this version commit and this version commit. But in this case, what they're doing is they're creating a brand new commit. So like, what this can be somewhat tricky sometimes if, because this is actually modifying the Git history. Okay, it's a bit advanced, because it's going to wrap the heck out of this, but um, the problem with this, just oil, let's take note with rebasing. Merge is always a safer one. If you rebase, just with take note, it changes the data stream. So there's some scenarios where this can be an issue when you're pushing to the node. But other people have pulled from your um uh from the from that remote branch. Okay, so it's called the uh golden rule of rebasing. Okay, so basically never rebase when you're on a public branch. Okay, so um because the reason for this is because it changes your uh, your common history. So, alternatively, you can just stick to like the merging workflow. Okay, so 
Yeah, that is on merging versus rebasing. We won't go into the details of how to rebase. Uh, you all can try that later. Um, uh, on this note, so you all saw we had two different thingies, right? We have SSH and we have get, uh, HTTPS as well. Okay, so usually you would use HTTPS if you don't have a SSH key set up, or you can only use HTTPS, right? But if you have SSH, you can clone it by SSH. Okay, so for me, I have my SSH set up. So what I can do is I can uh, show y'all. Okay. Um, okay. Um, basically, I have my, you can see all these files, right? I have my SSH set up. So that's basically my SSH config folder. Right? On Windows, it would be a bit different, but this is for Mac and for uh, Linux in general or Unix. Okay. But the reason for why you prefer SSH, especially for GitHub, is because GitHub is a bit annoying. It'll ask you to create a personal access token. I don't know if you have encountered this before, but if you create a private repository, and you pull and push from a private repository, you need to add a PAT every time you push a pull. And this is very tedious and very annoying. Okay, but otherwise, um, if you have SSH, you don't need to do this all the time. And SSH is just a one-time setup, so it's very convenient. Set up on your local machine. You never need to deal with um, all these uh, things like entering your PAT or entering your password. Okay, so NUS doesn't do this. So it's fine, but oh, is it? I'm not really sure. I'm not used to it. The maximum is one year. Once it expires, it's very, very annoying. Oh, is it? Okay, I mean, that's why I suggest this. <laughs> oh no no I mean but if you use GitHub consistently over time you will still need to update your PAT. I mean but GitHub is forced upon us. Yeah. Use what? So W tools. Oh their own tools, yeah. I've not tried it actually. Like, I'm not sure about the details. I've not tried because for me, I just use SSH, so I don't know about all these password based authentication methods. But um, if I'm not wrong, there's something called GitHub CLI as well, or something like this. I don't know if this is what you're talking about. Uh, I'm not sure actually, I've got to read this, but you can explore this on your own later. Okay, I'm not, I've not used this before, but I just know it exists. Uh, uh, explore this on your own later. So that's just, uh, basically what that, in case you're all wondering, this is some, this is a command line wrapper that GitHub created for Git. Okay, so it's GitHub's own command line interface for Git repos. To make it easier to work with GitHub repos. And that's it. Like, I mean, if you just stick to Git, you won't go wrong. Like, GitHub is just being extra, but let them, I mean, let them do their own thing, I guess. Um, right, so I, I think I showed you all my config, right, just now. Uh, yeah, so for me, I just set it up like this. Kind of similar. Um, Okay, so now this is on how to use GitHub's forking and pull request feature, like what you mentioned the last time, right? Like not earlier in the session. So GitHub has this separate way of creating branches called forking. Okay, it's a bit annoying because like, like it doesn't really sometimes tie neatly with your Git workflow, or sometimes it does. Like it depends on how you set it up. So let's just clone this repository. 
and then go inside it before me and put that hello and then i'll just create i don't know hello world this is my change okay then i will just get status and then get if just so i can see my changes let's say i commit it Okay, now um, Okay, so the whole idea is now that I've made this change but now GitHub has a separate way of allowing you fork right, so I can fork this and basically what it'll do is Okay, let me just do this first. I'll show you all the difference. Okay, so. Okay, so you all can see. Now there are two separate remote repositories. One belongs to this hacker school Git organization and the other one belongs to me. So now there are two separate remotes. So say now I don't want to work on this one. I'll just throw it away. Now what I can do is I can go and uh, okay this is just to make sure that uh, you know there have been no changes made by other people so I'll just do this get pull rebase uh, okay and this is this is this actually depends on your organization like depends on the workflow so every organization has their own way of using git and having managing all these different changes okay but in general this is uh the convention because you already have a separate re remote so you don't want merge commits to show up across remotes as well so that's why it's funky um then you will now say i'm tracking yeah sorry for the command Yeah, right. So, um, right now I have a, an origin called Git, or, uh, I have a remote called origin, and the URL for that origin is this. But say now I want to add this one, how do I do that? Is I just get remote add, oh, I'll just copy this actually. So, oh, oops, what went wrong? For the name, forked remote. And then if I type remote dash V, right, so now you can see that I've got two remotes for my local repository. Okay, so the difference is this one. It's called fork remote and it belongs to me. It's my personal fork. And this is the origin and lots of this will get. Okay, so uh, this is uh this is how you are working with I mean it doesn't have to be on GitHub, so I can add something that's maybe I can I can add a repository that's hosted on like GitLab or I can add another repository somewhere else as well. So it doesn't have to be from GitHub. But like the whole idea of using forking for GitHub is to add it as a separate remote. Then you push your changes to your remote. Then you create a pull request from your from your uh, fork to the original uh, repository. All right, so that's the whole idea. Okay, so if I was to um, go back and I was to just um, say get status. Okay, so my branch is ahead of origin master, and now it's actually also ahead of uh. Uh, my fork remote. So now I want to push it to my fork remote. Right, so let's see. Okay, and then let me just show you all the difference. Right, so. Okay, maybe it's not very obvious. 
Okay, but now y'all can see, right? In Hacker School Git, um, there's that, that, that commit didn't show up, but in my fork, it showed up. Okay, so that's the difference. Because what I did was, I pushed my latest commit to my fork remote, to the master branch of my fork remote. Okay, so that's the distinction here. If I did git push origin master as well, it is, then it will show up. Okay, I don't have permission because I'm not a member of that Hacker School Git organization, but um, if I had permission, uh, 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 and if I, could, if I had permission to push to origin, that commit would have showed up here as well. Okay? So that's the difference in, 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 uh, in what happens when you fork. So now you can see that it says my branch is also one commit ahead of Hacker School Git. Because Hacker School Git does not have this commit. Right? So that's all. Let's go on. So now what happens is, generally speaking, uh, when you have when you have this, right? Say this commit, I'm ready to push this to my I'm ready to like commit this to Hacker School Git. So what I can do is I can create a pull request. And then I will just right. So from my master branch in this fork. I am saying that I want to add my all these commits to Hacker School Git to Hacker School Git uh, remote, right? So and these are the commits. Okay, if there's only one commit here. All these files changed. All these changes. So just create it. Right, demo. Right. Right, and that's all. I mean, if you merge conflicts. Uh, you have to resolve them here, but there are no much conflicts because I just added one more line, so it's fine. Right. Okay, and in general, um, your git commit messages have a certain convention to it. So in general, there's always a title and a body. Okay, so the title shouldn't be more than 72 characters, actually. Okay, 72 to 80 characters because um, the reason for this is historical. Like... <laughs> Because on older computers, like 72 was where you would wrap around the title, like onto the next line. So your title should be displayed on one line. So that was the reason for why they said 72 characters. But that's not really important nowadays. By this, what they mean is the imperative mood. So, uh, like for examples of imperative, you would always, the tense is always like stuff like, um, you, you all can see the difference, right? Like. Um, be, do, eat, drink. It's not like drinking or drinks. It's drink. Like, that's imperative move. Okay, so you all can go and read about this. This is convention. This is just convention. Okay, so it's not changes. It's change. Or it's not changed. It's just simply change. Okay, so it's simple. Um, and this is the body of the text. Uh, you, you elaborate on the need for the changes, the changes you made, and uh, you know any other technical reasons you might have. Okay, so this is one random message from the kernel. This is the title. This is the body. Okay, so y'all can see uh, there's a signed off as well, but it's not really relevant. There's a note at the end. So this is the the, 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 the structure of this is yes. problem then uh, this is the problem and in general you also talk about the change. Right, so you talk about the current status, the, the current, uh, you know, how the, the repo was, the problem that, you know, that commit, and then you talk about the changes you proposed and why you did that. This, that's the current, that's the three um, main categories. In this case, you're missing the, uh, the changes made, which is covered by the title actually. Yeah, so that's why it's missing this. But otherwise, that's the three main, that's, those are the three main categories in your commit message. Body. Right, um, so you're not also limited to, uh, let me just show it to you, let me just show it to you, oh, git branch, I guess, git, for all the time, um, yeah, it's git, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, 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 all right, so maybe this, y'all can, y'all can try to own, uh, it's not too, Complicated, but basically the whole idea is that if I had more um 
if I have more branches here, I will create commit. I could create pull requests across those branches. So all I have to do is, yeah, I'll select my the other branches from here, right? So that's what that slide is saying. But I'll just skip it because you're out of time. So this is some of the commands we've covered. Check out merge clone remote push pull. Okay, um, going on. Oops. Let's just quickly clone this. Okay. Then I'll show you all the. Oh, oops. Yeah. Okay, so this is the current status of the repository. Say we want to revert. Um, okay, how about we just keep this flag? Say we want to revert. Um, which one? Okay, we just say we want to revert this one, the one in the middle. Okay, update file to see. What we can do is we can get revert a96. Okay, I'm just going to copy this actually. I'll just show you all. Uh, what this does okay so get lock should up here okay so basically what i've done is let's see this. so this was the commit and this was the change made in the commit we uh renamed we deleted b and we added c to our file right so now if we were to see our file it says B as well. So that's what git revert does. It reverts commits. Like git is very useful in that sense because you can now remove the changes made by certain commits. So that's what the revert command does. It removes changes made by certain commits. Okay, so on my remote, my um, file says C, but on my local, because I reverted it, it says B. Okay, so y'all can see the difference, right? So that is what a revert does. Undoes changes made by a specific commit. Okay, so now if I also want to, there's something called git, git reset. So if I say, um, maybe, uh, maybe, uh, just add a large line here. Fine, fine. Then if I just start the status. So um, it's been modified. Yeah, so y'all can see it now. So now what I can do is I can also just uh, unstage my changes, then I can type git status. Then I can type, uh, yeah, that's it. So basically what happens is the contents of the file is the same, but it's just that I told git to shift this to my working directory. like. Um, and to like because over here it was in the your staged, but now this is just in my working directory. Okay, so that is what git reset does. And now, if I want to, uh, if I want to even you know reset reset this back to like the original one, I will just oops sorry, I missed the space. Okay, uh, and now I've type cat file. Okay, you see my change has been, my, my working change just now has been reversed as well. Okay, so basically the whole idea was that, okay, let me just go back. Now, now we are going in reverse. We're going from here, to here oh, sorry, we're going from here to here. Then we, uh, we discarded our changes in the recent day. We're going in reverse now. So that was the whole point of what we said and uh, check out. I check out the brand new, I check out the original file. Right, so. Okay, that's a lot of stuff. Maybe you'll just quickly skip it. Okay, y'all can go and play with this later on. But the command is here. Okay, so. Yep. Okay, y'all, you can go and read about this later. Yeah, there's a lot more stuff you can do, like get cherry pick, get. Uh, if I just show you all the SCM, I know. 
there's a lot more stuff you can do. Like, um, you, there's a merge tool. Uh, there's also something called a git diff. Oh, sorry, a git, uh, what is it called? Uh, there's a cherry pick, there's uh, apply, there's debugging for bisect, and all these other commands. So there's submodules as well over here. And you can also set up your own git server. So in case you don't want to use GitHub or GitLab, you can set up your own git server. So the instructions for that is right somewhere here. Okay, uh, I think it's under server admin when you set up your own server, right? So it's yeah somewhere there. Okay, um, you can do this on your own time. So these are all very popular libraries. Okay, so just now I showed y'all um the command to um. Sorry, was due to get that was this. Okay, never mind. Was this right? But now, if you try this, it looks the same. But this is just a way to um, like th this is just an additional way to get a uh, a better looking graph. Like, let me just paste this and see if there's a difference. Okay, I think this one's better. Okay, um, right. So you can see you can basically change the format in the manner you want it to be. So and then um, this is actually a very long com command though, right? So the idea is that uh, okay, the idea is to basically prettify the git log output and customize it however you want it. And now because this is a very long command, we need some way to save it. We need to alias it. So we can just do this. So basically, it just says, add this to my git, add this to my global git config, this alias. Okay, I think I already have an alias, but I think it's just going to override it. But it's fine. Okay, and then if I just type git lg, like the alias command is basically equivalent to typing this whole thing. Right, it's just but I just type git lg, so that's the whole idea of aliasing it. You save this whole long command as two characters. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and you can also check out specific commits. So if I type git log, and if I want to check out the first commit, I'm just going to show this to y'all because until now we've just been checking out branches, right? But you can also check out commits themselves. Um, so it'll say I'm um, switching to this commit. You're in a detached state, and um. Yeah, so if I just type cat file, you can see it's at the original, uh, at the very first, uh, at the state it was in the very first commit. Okay, right, so otherwise, you can also try this command. This is very nifty, very useful. Like before you want to do a merge, you, you normally do a git diff branch on merge too. Okay, um, so this is very useful. And, um, if you mess up, typically you would use revert, but you can also do a reset. Okay, so um, so a reflog basically shows you a, a list of all the changes we've made so far, right? So you can basically reset. So just now, what I did was so just. Why let's just try this? Okay, um, okay, we, have, we have not really done much more. We have not really done that many. Uh, maybe if I just add uh, one more. Okay, I think it's changed. And if I could reset, alright. So, then if I was to... So now if, I'm, if I have this, what I can do is, maybe I'm going to reset it back 
like I made all these mistaken changes. I made this mistaken change. What I can just do is I can I can now reset hard to this one. Okay, so if I was to type cat file, okay, now you can see that it's back to B. Okay, so what git reset does is it's very dangerous because it basically deletes all this history. You know what? Adds a new commit on top. Reset, deletes all of it. So reset is actually a lot more dangerous than revert. So if you're working on a public branch, typically you just revert, or unless if, if you if it's only safe to reset if you haven't pushed those changes to your remote. So because if other people pull those changes and then you reset, and then you push the reset the changes, they will have a messed up history and that, that will have you have a lot of problems for them to understand why they have so many merge conflicts or why they can't uh, view the history. Okay, so you only use reset. Really, you only use reset on your local machine or if you're sure that no one has pulled from your remote branch. Okay, so that's when you use reset. Otherwise, you normally use re revert. Okay. Um, right, so uh, you can do this on your own. And then there's also this cool trick for GitHub. You can do, you can try this to dot dev, and you can try this VS Code in the browser basically. Uh, so this is a new feature in GitHub, like relatively new. And then these other Git commands you can try. So the other one that you might use a lot is uh, cherry pick and git bisect. So this is actually quite useful. It saved me a couple of times in my project. And yeah, so there's actually a lot of different workflows that you all can explore. So it really depends. So you all can go and read this on your own free time. And you can also self-host your own Git servers and you can, all, you can also build your own Git. Okay, so all these things are there in the slides. You can go and look at this. Right, so we had this advanced Git workshop in 2020. The recording is here. So you all can go and check it out.